Hello and welcome to this video and on this video I'm going to be looking at the eight greatest jazz rock fusion violin players. Um, somebody has suggested this in the comments of one of the videos and I thought actually that would be quite interesting to do because on that list would be some very important musicians in the history of jazz rock fusion but also the violin is the sort of the special instrument that has so many defi times defined the sound as jazz rock fusion. Um, it's like the instrument that you don't expect to be there, but it is. Um, of course, jazz violin playing uh, already had a history um, before jazz fusion came in. Um, I think that um, the pioneers of jazz violin, which be guys like Joe Venuti and then Stefan Grappelli, um, brought in a European aspect to um, jazz and that's very apparent when we look at the history of jazz fusion violin playing um, but there's also been incredible players like Stuff Smith that have also brought in a very bluesy rootsy jazzy aspect to violin playing and that's in there too um, the the um, jazz violin also is able to bring in influences from indie music and I think that's because it's a fretless instrument and it's it's very um, applicable to microtones and little shifts and bends and that has also become a very important sound to jazz rock fusion so I think this is pro quite an important thing to do to actually look at the jazz violinists in jazz fusion now I've had to do a little bit of research on this um, I'm not totally knowledgeable about some of these violin players but I think I've been able to bring it down to eight jazz fusion violinists that I think are very very important to the genre so this is like the classic eight once I got to eight I couldn't really find anyone else that I felt worthy of putting into this list so this eight is a is a specialist of musician so shall we start at number eight so at number eight we have a jazz violinist that um, died pretty young actually um, and I think he would have had a much greater influence had he had lived longer. Uh, he's a um, European violinist. He's uh, from Poland. I'm going to have to pronounce his name very carefully because I've only ever read it and I don't never heard anyone say his name. But I'm going to call him Zbigniew Seifert. Zbigniew Seifert, who was a violinist born in 1946. He sadly died of cancer in 19, I think it was 1979, that's right. Um, he um, emerges um, in the 70s. He, re he records a number of solo albums, which are quite incredible, very fusiony, very funky, and with some incredible jazz violin playing. And if you want to check this guy out, I would go and check out his self-titled solo album that he made for Capitol Records in I think around about 1977. It's a really incredible jazz fusion album. On YouTube there are um, some videos of him playing with Philip Cuthrin. And um, here we have one of the first of many on this list that have actually come from Europe. This guy was a really incredible player. Um, his name's cropped up on the fringes of jazz rock fusion history, which is why I put him at number eight. But he was a really fantastic player and I wanted to be able to mention him as he's, he's been dead a long time and these people can often get forgotten, but the uh, the echoes of what he did are still there. So that's who we've got at number eight, Zygnir Seifert. At number seven, I have Don Sugarcane Harris. All right Now, Don Sugarcane Harris actually emerged in the 1950s in a doo-wop group called Don and Dewey, where he was singing. And then when the 1960s came in, he switched over to violin. Now, Don Sugarcane Harris actually brings in a very strong blues element um, to jazz fusion violin playing. He, um, uh, in the 60s, was one of the first people to amplify a violin. And he's very, very important in terms of the de development of jazz fusion vi violin playing. I would say this is the first guy to do this. You know, he jammed with the blues breakers. And what we have with Don Sugarcane Harris is a very similar story to what we have with Jerry Goodman, who will be on the list later on. Uh, Don Kane Harris was classically trained violinist that had come through the soul R&B route, and it's those two elements together which really create his sound. Most of us fusion fans will know him for all the work he did uh, with the Mothers of Invention and Frank Zappa, 
and he contributes some incredible violin playing to Hot Rats. Of course, Charlotte Ponty's on that album, and that often overshadows um, his input there, but anyone who's actually listened to Hot Rats will know that it's Don Sugar Kane Harris's solos that are all over that album, and he, he contributes some incredible stuff on that, and that would have been very influential to the history of jazz rock fusion. Um, he then went on to record a whole bunch of um, solo albums as well, which aren't that well known. I had to do a bit of research into this, but there's some really incredible playing on there. Um, and there's an album which um, is called Keys Up, which he made in 1975. That's a heavy jazz fusion album, very much over on the funky side and the bluesy side, but it's still a great jazz fusion album. But I think his contributions with the mothers and his general influence on pop and rock music means that we can allow Don Sugar Kane Harris into this list at number seven. Right, at number six, we have a real monster of jazz rock fusion, right? Um, and it's someone I don't know that well. I've had to do a little bit, bit of research into this guy, but I've known his name for years and years and he's cropped up on a number of albums I have. And that is the incredible Didier Lockwood. Um, now, Didier Lockwood um, has also had an influence on prog violin playing. And there's not that many prog violin playing, but he did for a time, uh, you know, play violin with Magma. Um, he's from France. I think he may have well been overshadowed by Jean-Luc Ponty, another French jazz rock um, uh, fusion player. He died in 1918, which is uh, relatively young. He's not around anymore. Uh, but he, he, he's p uh, contributed to so many incredible jazz rock fusion albums over the years. And he's also produced a whole bunch of solo albums. Um, he made an album uh, in 1976 um, called Jazz Rock. Uh, and that's a great album. I knew this album. Uh, it's one of the few albums I knew. I didn't, I didn't have it, but I'd heard it. That's a really great album to go and check out if you want to check out Didier Lockwood. And it really is a full on jazz fusion album. This is one of the things that's great about this list is these guys, all of them on this list, have produced quality, fiery jazz rock fusion. And he really does on that album. There's a track on that album called Elbow. And it's, it's using sort of um, analog synths that sound almost sequenced. They're being played, but they sound sequenced. And it's got this great big house music beat on there. And this track is like is like rave, um, 20, 30 years before rave happens. So that's who I've got at number six is Didier Lockwood, very important violinist in the history of jazz rock fusion. Right, who do we have at number five? Well, at number five, I've decided to put Stephen Kindler. Stephen Kindler came to prominence in the Mavish Orchestra, but he wasn't the upfront violin player. He was um, the second violin player in the Mavish, second Mavish Nuxia. We have, of course, John Luc Ponty playing solo violin on Visions of the Emerald Beyond and um, Apocalypse. Um, in that ensemble was a string section and on violin in the string section was Stephen Kindler. Um, live, he started to contribute solos and he plays the violin cadenza on Visions of the Emerald Beyond, all right? This in itself, would put him in the history books for Jazz Rock Fusion, but it probably wouldn't um, make my top eight. Um, but after leaving the Mavish Nuxia in 1975, he then joins forces with Jan Hammer. Now I'm about to do a uh, video on Jan Hammer. I think Jan Hammer's solo albums uh, in the 1970s are amongst the most important jazz rock fusion albums. They weren't as successful as the Headhunters and Return Forever, but I think in terms of quality and innovation, they lead the way. I'm starting to think these are the, that could be the greatest run of jazz rock fusion albums in the genre. And, and Jan Hammer's doing more than just jazz rock fusion. On those albums, Steve Kindler is playing a lot of solos. Some of the greatest jazz rock fusion violin playing that I know of. You know, he first turns up on uh, Jan's solo album, First Seven Days, where he contributes some fantastic violin playing for that. And then it, he goes balls out on Oh Yeah. And I'm starting to think, the more I do this channel, that Oh Yeah could well be the greatest jazz fusion album ever made. I wouldn't have said that a few months ago, but I really am 
starting to think that that is the peak of the genre. And Stephen Kinder plays some incredible stuff on that. Um, he really is a fantastic jazz fusion um, violinist. Um, I'm currently putting some stuff together with the great guitarist Roy Marchbank and he's actually appeared on the last album that Roy Marchbank made with Atma and Earth from Greg Howe's band and a whole bunch of other stuff. And when you check his soloing out there, it's absolutely incredible. So I think for his, his uh, contributions to the Jan Hammer group alone, I really think uh, Stephen Kindler needs to come in at number five. And if you're not aware of his playing, go checking out now. Okay, right. As we get to the last four, we start, we slowly move into superstar level. So um, here's another musician at number four who is so important to the history of jazz rock fusion. And that is uh, Michael Urbaniak, all right? Who is actually a multi-instrumentalist. He plays saxophone, a whole bunch of other instruments. Um, he made a whole list of um, solo albums in the 70s, 80s and 90s. He's a really incredible player. He's explored so many areas within the jazz rock fusion uh, genre and he also worked with his wife, Ursula Dudziak, who is one of the great jazz fusion vocalists. A really incredible singer with a five and a half octave range. There's, that's incredible stuff. But also, which I think separates him from some of the other players on below him, he's, he's played on so many albums. I'm going to read out some of the people he's worked with over the years. He's worked with Billy Cobham, Buster Williams, Chick Corea, Elvin Jones, Freddie Hubbard, George Benson, Herbie Hancock, Joe Henderson, Joe Zawinul, Kenny Barron, Larry Coriel, Lenny White, Marcus Miller, Quincy Jones, Ron Carter, Roy Haynes, Wayne Shorter, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I first came across him on his um, incredible solo he plays on, I think it's it could well be called Backyard Ritual. I haven't got this written down here. It's off 2-2 anyway, Miles Davis's album. There's an incredible violin solo um, on there. Um, so the whole weight of sessions he's done over the years, plus the incredible stuff he's done himself, really puts him on this list. There's an album he made with his wife, and his wife's vocal, or ex-wife, because I think they got divorced at some point, but so I should be called his ex-wife, he's watching probably getting upset um it, there's um an album called heritage and his wife's virtuosa vocal and she's singing so high in the register and she's able to intermingle in with his violin playing it's quite unique actually when you hear it so that's who i've got at um number four is just uh, sorry michael Urbaniak. um oh one more thing we've got to mention about him because it comes up on this channel over and over again, is the incredible album he did. It's one of the classic fusion albums, which is called Fusion 3. It's one of Steve Gadd's great uh, drum performances as well. It's just a mind-blowing album. Um, and it gets mentioned every time I talk about Steve Gadd. Uh, but it's beyond that, it is really one of the great fusion albums. There's a whole host of fusion albums he made in the 70s, but if you want to check out a, a, a classic jazz fusion album by, by Michael Urbaniak, then go and check out Fusion 3. Go and check it out. Not now, but in a few minutes when I finish the video. Right, who have we got at number three? We have El Shankar. El Shankar is an Indian classical uh, violinist that came to prominence in Shakti. Um, he, uh, after doing Shakti, he, he, he moves outwards. He starts to play with Frank Zappa. He plays with Peter Gabriel. He has a solo career where he's doing almost like straight um, Indian classical music, but not quite straight in Indian classical music. And he's also in doing stuff which is almost like pop, fusion, all sorts of different things. El Shankar, I think, has got a violin sound because of the Indian classical, I, I want to say influence, but it's more than influence, um, technical approach, the theoretical background. Um, I think that um, El Shankar brings a completely new take on um, electric violin playing. He, um, he develops a double neck uh, um, violin, which I think my ears sort of tell me that what that does is extend the range of the violin. So he's able to play very low notes. His use of electronics is very interesting. In terms of pure fusion playing, the album to go and get, I would think would be um, the One Truth Band, you know, 1979, John McGoughlin, the Electric Dreams album. There's some incredible violin playing from on him from there. 
Um, his in influence in Shakti is, is all-encompassing. I think that would have changed violin playing. And I think the two guys that are going to be at number two and number one, it must have shaken their foundations to hear El Shanker in the late 70s playing like that. So who do we have at number two? Of course, it's Jerry Goodman, who is the, the guy, right? Mavish Lukša, they come in and they determine what the sound of fusion is going to be as far as I'm concerned. And Jerry Goodman comes in and he does that for violin playing. Um, and I think the reason why Jerry is so specially placed to do this is because of his influences. He's a, a virtuoso classical violin player who was brought up in a classical music family. Um, he's an orchestral player. He, he could, he could, uh, um, there's stories of um, him, when you read the Mavishnu books, um, of people being with him and him picking up a violin and just starting to play you know, classical pieces, note for note. So he's a full-on classical player. John McGoughlin said this is the reason why he took him into the group, because he knew that he would un be able to understand the technical requirements of that band because of his classical background. But he also um, was the violinist and sometime guitarist with The Flock. The Flock are a very, very important band that emerged in the late 60s, early 70s. They're almost like a pioneering fusion band. It could well be the case, if he had to join the Mavish Nuxture, that he could well have been on this list simply because of the um, stuff he did in The Flock. The Flock's a very important band. Um, um, Jerry Goodman's a really, really great guitarist. If you check out his solo album Like Children with Jan Hammer, he, he um, does some really great Hendrix-styled guitar playing. And so that's what we get with Jerry Goodman's style, is this sort of really extreme classical influence married with a sort of Hendrix approach. Um, he's a pioneer of amplified um, violin playing. He's a pioneer of effects. And his sound, I think it's, it, his sound is so important to the sound of the Mavish Nuxture and also the sound of how we perceive jazz fusion violin playing. Um, there's only one guy that can really supersede him and it's the guy we've got at number one and at number one of course we have the incredible John Luc Ponty who is a giant of jazz rock fusion playing I've done a tall ton of videos on John Luc Ponty what can I say again French violinist so we've got someone coming over from Europe same as Michael Urbaniak, Didier Lockwood, Zvigliu Seifert um, all non-American, European. If you put El Shanker in the mix, there's so many people here that have not come from America. It's quite interesting, that is. So John John McPonty is a conservatoire-trained classical uh, violin player. He, he sort of emerges in the 60s as a sort of the next stage in jazz violin playing. He's really taking on the um, innovations of John Coltrane. He makes some incredible albums then. He's discovered by Frank Zappa who uh, then makes an album with him uh, called King Kong. And I think this really introduces the sort of idea of fusion to Jean-Luc Ponty. He spends some time in the Zappa band, which I think expands his artillery and his, his sort of vocabulary. And then he gets pulled into the Mavish Nuxture. And I felt in the Mavish Nuxture, he was the voice that was equal to John McGoughlin. Some incredible stuff there. As I've said a million times before, my favorite album of all time is um, Visions of the Emerald Beyond. And in great part, that is because of the input of Jean-Luc Ponty. After that, he then um, has a solo career where he produces some of the greatest jazz fusion albums of all time. I've done a video on the 70s fusion albums by Jean-Luc Ponty. They really are masterpieces, one after the other. He never puts a foot wrong. He never goes too far down the, the sort of funky disco fusion area. He never goes off the rails and, and does sort of avant-garde stuff. He, he, he plows a channel, which is absolutely incredible. He sells a ton of records. He's really, really successful. And that sets him up, you know, he's uh, brought a whole bunch of musicians to the fore, like Alan Zavardi, Alan Holdsworth, um, um, Rayford Griffin, um, just a whole bunch of really great players have come through his band. Um, he really is one of the greatest fusion musicians of all time. I think if I was doing a top 10, he would definitely be in there. Um, so that's who I've got at number one, Jean-Luc Ponty. If you want to know more about Jean-Luc Ponty, if you've got this point, so we didn't really talk enough about Jean-Luc Ponty. He, oh no, this is the one. Here will be appearing a video where you can really have get me talking for a whole 20 minutes on Jean-Luc Ponty. Anyway, that is my top eight jazz fusion violinists. Right, I've done it. 
what am I going to do next? How much school can I go next? You know, should we have a look at the top 10 jazz fusion bagpipe players? The top 10 um, jazz fusion steel pan players? Who do we, who could, what can we do next? How obscure can we get? Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching. If you like, like. If you want to subscribe, if you want to subscribe. And if you want to support me, go and check out my Patreon. The link's down below. Thank you very much and I'll see you soon. Bye.